Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we're tackling the question, what would be our ideal wild animal companion? Yeah, and you may think to yourself, why would you be worried about that? <laughs> it's not that we're worried, we're, we're we obsessed see, we, well, all of a sudden. Some, we both experienced something via a screen <laughs> <laughs> that has now piqued a certain interest that I didn't know I had. Uh, this, all, this all goes back to, uh, well, how you may have experienced it through the lens of my social media, shout out to Red MC on Twitter. Okay. I tweeted uh, a while back, Netflix got me crying over a damn octopus. And I used the octopus emoji, which don't think I've ever used it in any context. Oh, you used the emoji? Why not? Did you type octopus and then it popped up? You're like, oh, there's an emoji. Well, of course. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't know. I wouldn't have known this. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, I don't know how to find an emoji if it doesn't pop up. There's certain times when I'm like thinking, I feel like this conversation calls for an emoji, but I'm so inadequate. You you do the visual search through all the options because that's happened to me a couple of times. Yeah, I'd, and then, then that that's just soul crushing. And then you're like, you know what? Is this a food or this a, is, this or is a not traffic me. sign? I don't this know. This is not me. This, this, is, this is not who I am. And then I just. Uh, you leave it off. I leave it off. Well. Um, but if it pops up, I'm like, oh, an octopus. And Twitter will do that for you. So we're of course talking about the Netflix documentary, My Octopus Teacher, which I watched and then. Came to work the next told day. Told Link about. And you were just gushing about this, this Netflix documentary. Right, so we're gonna talk about that. So, and we're also gonna talk about some other animal friendships. And then we're gonna talk about the, like we said at the beginning, the wild animal friendships that we might want to personally instigate. Now, let me say, spoiler alerts, forthcoming, because actually, spoilers forthcoming is a spoiler alert. Um, yeah, and I You wanna... might wanna go and watch Octopus Teacher. My, it's called My Octopus Teacher on Netflix. Now, we're, we're gonna discuss it in great detail. I do not think that anything that we're gonna say is going to make it where you don't want to then also watch it. So, but, but, but if, you don't want, if you're a spoiler reverse person, you wanna go watch it right now. Not even that, I would even, you know, it's, I think, yeah, there's a couple of things in the documentary that I just wanna speak about plainly that I, I do think it's better to experience uh, cold, which is why I did not tell my family you were talking to Christy about it. It wasn't at work. Or maybe it was at work and then. No, no, I was talking about it when we had our, um, I, I actually invited you uh, and your wife over to take a dip in the hot tub. Oh yeah, that's when the you first, were talking about the, the first octopus. sort of like hot tub dip of, of COVID. And era. then I, I went back home and I think it was that night or was maybe the next night and uh, Christy, poor girl. She has gotten herself into a uh, a binge watching spree of One Tree Hill. I I, I didn't get a permission. There's to only talk one about way to get somebody out of that is with an octopus. octopus. <laughs> Eight limbs like, to pull you out of One Tree Hill. She goes to bed a lot earlier than me on a weekend, and so I'll burn the midnight oil and I'll watch something. And I was, you know, she was upstairs. She was it. And she went upstairs earlier, and, and I was like, "What you doing?" She's like, "Oh, I'm, I think I'm just going to watch One Tree Hill." I'm like, "Okay, okay, we, I'm not going to watch that. That's that's your that's the thing that." And you know what? There's a lot of nostalgia. I'm not going to make fun of her She's for seen watching it all this before. thing. She well, she said, "You know what? Turns out I haven't seen it all. She didn't I would just it? I would just catch it when I caught it, but it wasn't a binge it was thing before the days of binging. And now she's like putting all the pieces together and reliving her." I think we were we were newlyweds when How she watched that How many pieces stuff. are there to put together? Oh, well, there's, I mean, there's just one tree and one hill. <laughs> it turns out there's there's a surrounded community and lots of I don't know. There's basketballs involved. I've got there's I, and there's a kid. There's a couple with multiple a, basketballs. I don't know how many. But I went downstairs and I watched the uh, my octopus teacher. And then the next morning she was like, "What what did you end up doing?" And I, and I told her, and she was like, "I wanted to watch that." 
Rhett wouldn't shut up about it, and I, I, yeah. I, I kind of wanted to watch it. My wife was upset that I watched it without her, but I, you so know, I, I, did, I got into it not knowing how impactful it was gonna be on me personally. I did not tell her anything about it that you hadn't already told her, and I didn't tell the kids anything, but we got uh, the kids to watch it, and I watched it again. Twice. I watched it twice, homie. Was it good the second time? It was It was good the second time. Well, and the, so I, if you, I, if I rarely you, watch anything the second time, and it was still good, so I I think, just wanna give people permission. Yeah, because there's I, permission I, I'm not, not listen. I'm not a spoiler averse person. I, I know I, you are. But so if you're like me, and I'm even saying you can you can you can still listen to us and then watch it. Right. I, what I'm saying is, but it's not ideal. Some because I, I don't like telling people who've just tuned in to use an antiquated term to this podcast to then go enjoy some other media. That's just not good business. Link. That's not good business. So I, I'm just saying that you can go and watch it if you really want to. Um, but if you're listening, but watching it and, and you're, seeing it from the perspective of the filmmaker is going to be much better than us talking about it. And then you should come back and listen. To us, so if you it's, again, what I was trying to say was, it's not just about spoilers. Is if you if you know you you're looking for things to watch, and you're committed to listening to this, and you promise that you're going to come back and listen to this. If you promise, then I'm going to say, you know what? Don't s stop this right now. Yeah, if you come and back. do it in that order. Right. But we're also going to talk about other things. If we set you free, if it's true love, you will come back. I we've we both have other stories that are in a similar vein of that, of the octopus teacher. Unlikely animal human, fr like legitimate friendships. Yeah. Like friendships that are kind of mind blowing that I did not know were possible. And now that we do, it might change the tra trajectory of our lives. And entire lives. Um, but we're gonna talk about that stuff too. I got I got some, I've read up on some, you've read up on some, yeah. so so we're gonna get to that. But I'm I'm mostly gonna dig deep into my soul because that seems to be what happens in these situations. There's a, something happens on the soul level when people spark friendships with wild animals. Did you weep during My Octopus Teacher? I felt the pressure to weep because you not only tweeted about it, but then you, you talked about it at length. I think we've established that it doesn't. And I didn't. It doesn't take much for me to weep while watching something. I weep during commercials occasionally. Um, I wept. But you've learned why. I've right? learned why? From I thought from therapy you learned why. Well, it's a combination. I don't, I don't wanna bait you here. No, it's a combination of two things. Number one, um, I am actually in the, I don't know the, I don't know the name of it, but I'm in like what would be called, believe it or not, the sensitivity triad of the Enneagram. I don't know if that's the correct term, but there's basically a few numbers that are actually significantly they're on, I'm actually on the sensitive side of the spectrum of people, but I also have a personality based in all kinds of things, you know, and that is has kind of shielded me from my emotions. So there's a this weird thing that happens where there's actually a very high level of sensitivity that is happening in me compared mm -hmm. to an average person, hmm. but. I have sort of a shell of a personality that will make you think that I'm not experiencing the things. And I actually, I'm so good at constructing the personality that I can actually keep the sensitivity and the emotions and the feelings from my own brain, like hidden from myself. And so I would have told you before therapy, I am not a sensitive person. Yeah, I cry at commercials sometimes. My dad's the same way, he's always done that. But but that's actually a sign of that. Yeah, it, it, it's, it means there's, there is a deep level of sensitivity that exists in my person that has to find a way to come out in order for me to be in, in equilibrium. And so what ends up happening is often instead comes of out on an octopus. dealing with like sitting there and like crying about something that's happening to me personally, I will see something happening between a man and an octopus on Netflix and begin to weep because there's a lot of potential for sensitivity there. Now that's not to say it seems that I'm implying that I cry in like things that pertain to my real life. And it's like, that doesn't happen either. So I, I, might, I might have a couple of layers. But anyway. But you've now only that been going we're talking about me for, for less than a year. <laughs> we're, right, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna divert this stream back to um, the streaming of the documentary. So I, it, and you'll tell me when when you cried. I have a I have a good guess, but I there's actually multiple times. Oh, okay. Well, then I I have three guesses. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, I mean it's my it's gonna be my wreck. 
at the end of this thing. Spoilers. Spoiler alert, there it is. Now, now, now they're not gonna hang on for the wreck. So this thing, just to, just to give a little overview uh, via Wikipedia, just for the sake of time, my octopus teacher came out um, on the 4th of September of this year, 2020. Uh, it's 85 minutes long. It's, it's out of South Africa and it is in English. Mm -hmm. The film shows how in 2010, Foster, uh, who is Craig Foster, he's a filmmaker that then became the subject of this film that uh, uses footage he shot and some footage that was shot by another cinematographer um, and then directed by two other people. Um, so Foster began free diving in a cold underwater kelp forest at a remote location in False Bay near Cape Town, South Africa. So we're talking about the Horn of Africa, like the southernmost point in Africa, which we're, you know, it's down there. It's getting, it's cold. It's getting cold down there. And this dude would swim in the water in just a pair of shorts. And we're talking and about like, like not, not uh, scuba diving. We're talking about snorkeling. He had like a snorkel and a mask, he, fins, a weight belt in order to kind of get down into the kelp forest and a pair of shorts. It's called free diving. Free diving. He, he was holding his breath to yeah. go down and it was, he said the the water would get as cold as I had to I had to Google the conversion, but like forty five degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's and actually that sounds it's, crazy to me. It's if you unnaturally get in, if you get cold. In sixty degree water, that's frigid. Well, feeling. Just last night, I jumped into my pool. As you can see, we're the jacket boys today. We've got on jackets. Jacket weather is finally here in California, and I got into my pool last night, and it said on the thermometer that it was 70 degrees, but I felt like I was getting into a refrigerator. So to think about, yeah. and, and when we did the ice bath, it was in the 50s. 55, 50. So 45 degrees, we're talking, and it's and phenomenal. He just, he said, at one point early on in the documentary, when he, st you know, it's, he said, after a year, because he dove every day. Every day, without exception. After a year, he says, you start to crave the cold. I'm like, after a year, I don't, you know, anything that catastrophically numbing and, p and painful. But don't and, you and, want that? And death like when, when, he, when he said that, I, you know, but yeah, but I, I want it if it would like maybe after a week you start to crave <laughs> the cold. After a year, you start to crave the cold. Well, and a little, just a, a little bit of background that what got him to this point. So. He was a documentary filmmaker, he is a documentary filmmaker, and he essentially had a midlife crisis, right? He had been working on some documentaries and one in particular that was like following a tribe uh, somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you know, he had a kid and he, was, he began to just kind of feel disconnected and felt like he needed to drop everything, didn't know if he would ever film anything again, didn't know if he was gonna pick up a camera again. Went back to the Horn of Africa to get into the water because his family had had a house, which, did you see the house that they showed? That was, was literally- Below the tidal line, so like the waves crashed. It, it, how do, how do you build that house? Waves would go into the Waves would go house. into the house. So, and we're talking about like on a cliff, not that's like what, sandy beach. That's, yeah, and that's what he grew up doing, so he went he wanted back to his roots. He wanted to go back to the roots. And he would like, because he went skin diving as a kid. And so he just went back there not filming and then he he came upon an octopus. Not a special octopus, just a normal octopus. In, in fact, it's, what is it called? Octopus commonus or so? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what, the, it's a common octopus. That is not what it is, but it's, it, it is just a common octopus. And so, the, the things that he learned, observed, and started to film and share with the viewer uh, were just am amazing. So, you know, we'll, I, I wanna get into that, but first, we should promote some merch. Yeah. <laughs> let's get it out of the way. Okay, let's do that. At this point, do uh, you know Chunk? I do know Chunk. Got a sweatshirt and a t-shirt. It took him a it took Chunk a while to, to talk us here. into actually launching, you know, selling some merch for them. But it's the type they're, of thing you could they're wear. They're so relentless how often they, they contact us and ask us all these ridiculous things, but we said, okay, now that you don't really make many appearances on our channels anymore, now is the time to begin selling <laughs> your merch. Well, here's the thing. If you're a fan of Chunk, uh, you'll enjoy wearing this. But it's also a cool thing to wear because people will think that it is a real band 
and it just seems just on the cusp of believability. So right. it would it would spark either strange looks or maybe even a conversation. Whew, that's dangerous. Yeah, the Chunk World Tour. Only at amazon.com slash mythical. Now, one of the things about octopuses, is it octopi? Is that correct, octopi? Through the power of the internet, I think that most people who have an internet connection have learned. That they're smart. That they're smart. This is something that like five years ago, Maybe most people didn't know, but now most people are like, yeah, I've seen that crazy video where the octopus like changes color. I didn't know the octopuses could, octopi could change color and could do weird things like walk on two legs and sprout but, horns over their eyes. And then I also didn't know that if you're doing the IQ thing, the animal IQ thing, that these things would actually rank just a little bit above a dog in intelligence, which seems nuts to me. And on top of that, Two thirds of their cognitive power is in their limbs. Wild. I mean, they evolved on a completely different uh, branch. Branch. And you know, when we were hanging out and you were gushing and gushing and gushing about it, like an octopus shooting Mike out and, ink. Mike, our friend, ended up saying he was like, you know, the the way that that they're so intelligent. If they, if the way that they evolved, if they didn't live. If they only, I can't, why, can't, why can't I not put this thought together? They only live a year. If they lived as long as we do, evolutionarily speaking, they would be running the earth. <laughs> they, they, would have yeah. de, they would have developed technology and they would have vehicles to come on land and farm everywhere and well, create the internet. That's why it's so remarkable. We'd be nothing. That in the movie Arrival, the, the alien beings are octopus-like and I thought that was super you know, appropriate. The balancing factor for me is that they're beautiful, gross. Oh, not beautiful to me. I'm like, oh gosh. Like the first thing I told you was like, yeah, but when I think about an octopus, I think about them being able to squeeze through tight places because they're just so gelatinous. And I just get this. I when I went to the aquarium and I saw one put all of its arms through this little hole, and I was like, what are you doing? And then all of a sudden. It like the the bulbous head of the octopus. It just kind of started shoving its own head through this hole, and that was very disturbing to me. I was mm. like, "You're gonna get stuck. No one's gonna be able to yank you out of there." And it was just, but then it effortlessly went through. But it was just like gross. I think the thing that's scary to me about them, first of all, they're scarier on land than they are in the water because they're not moving very gracefully. But there's also, and I don't know if I- They're not typically on land, but. So no, like you, but you see- There the, was a scene where this one was on you land. You see the videos where like, they get like caught in a net and then they try to get back into the ocean and it's kind of crazy. There's some yeah, good YouTube videos about that. around. And but uh, I think there's a movie, an old movie, where there's like an octopus that's killing a bunch of people. It might be a squid, but there's a beak. It's called Octopussy. It's a James Bond <laughs> film. There's a beak in there up in the, like if you were to take, underneath, if you were to take the legs and like expose it, yeah, which doesn't happen in this particular particular documentary. There's there's a mouth in there that is powerful and can do things, and I'm scared of I'm scared of things like that. Well, like beaks. They, he talks about how there's a dr he calls it a drill, where he can drill a hole into a shell at a very particular spot that will make the 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 mollusk or whatever this inside just like let go of the shell and then well it inje you can, you can, it, it injects it with some kind of venom that paralyzes it at a certain it, spot but it's got to yeah. be a very particular part of the snail inside the shell okay so to continue the story he dives every single day for a year and then at some point he just runs into this octopus and he realizes that, okay, so octopuses, this is another thing I didn't know, octopuses, I'm gonna say octopuses, I know it's wrong, but I just, octopi sounds stupid. <laughs> octopuses have dens. So there's like a place at a particular rock, under a little rock where this thing lives an and returns. An octopus garden. An octopus garden. And, it, and he's like, okay. In the shade. Uh, this is where I live. And this is where I'm gonna be every time you come and see me. So he's like, okay, this and, is cool. And he decided to go there every single day. And in the opening of the documentary, there's a sound bite of him saying something like, "And there, but there was a boundary that I discover that you just don't cross." And I'm like, cool. is he gonna, is he gonna, 
Is he gonna expose himself to this octopus? I thought that he was gonna potentially make love to the octopus. But then I, I was like, yeah. I don't think this would be on Netflix. C- because you hear about the like the scientist who had the relationship with the dolphin, and then there was a there was a sexual component, or at least there was like a there was a there was a masturbation component in order to get the the dolphin to be more compliant. And right. we're not, today we're not talking about that. Right. So right. That's that's, next, next, we're not next saying week. anything. Else, but it did conjure those fears among my brain cells. But but that's not what they meant. But we can get back to that. What that you know what that. The boundary was a relational one, and there's also a documentarian part of this thing because it's I mean, a feat of filmmaking. The fact that like the things that he observed, like he observed the octopus using it, like wanting to inspect the human, and then using a shell as a shield, and then slowly approaching behind, like holding it up like a shield, and then finally sticking another tentacle out finally making contact with him and then realizing that there's a curiosity on the part of this octopus that he never named right. i mean he never gave the octopus a name i think it's a good, it's a good point it's a good I think, observation and that's the boundary i think he part did, of the boundary he was wasn't he wasn't trying to make octopus. it he wasn't trying to make it a pet and he was also as you will see in a second not trying to insert himself into the natural flow of nature that was going to uh happen with this octopus. We we can gush all day about all the things we learned about octopi, but you can get that from the documentary. But the thing that was interesting was if I mean he he could see the his the the octopus predator swimming around like pajama shark and then he was scared and he would go back every day like what's going to happen and then freaking he films a shark attack his friend the octopus. I mean, they were they had a bond at this point. The octopus knew him, would come out, they would swim together, you know, he would like swim on his he the octopus would she would hold on to his hand and And it would like it was it would like the octopus would like come up and settle on his chest. And, and give him a hug. And of course, because he, he's not wearing a wetsuit. That's part of the deal. He wanted to be as close to nature as possible. So he, this n- almost naked man but he wouldn't, has this octopus just nestling on his Chest. He didn't reach out, grab the octopus, and put him on. No, the octopus his did chest. it. The he, octopus he let the octopus instigate. Take the initiative. But the one you left out an important point, which was he was filming it. Once he was like, "Oh, I'm going to start filming this thing. I'm going to take my camera down there." He had developed this trust, this bond, and then he it was following him, and he dropped a lens off of the camera, and, and it, spooked. it spooked the octopus and. It did not go back to its den. So the next day he goes back, the thing is not in its den. It goes back the next day, it's not in its den. He's like, oh crap, I've ruined this relationship. We had built this trust. And you, you broken up. That was the first time I cried. I was already crying when, when he when, had the bond and then he broke the bond. Oh, so you you didn't cry when he successfully tracked her down and reconnected? Oh no, I cried again then. That's number two? Yeah. Well then was number three? I. I I mean, it was at least three times. I mean, the big point of horror was him filming this shark getting attacked, attack, attack her, and rip off one of her arms and just eat it. Mm -hmm. And then it gets to that, it gets to that boundary because he didn't stop it from happening. But then he says, "I couldn't resist." Basically, he couldn't resist helping. So he, he, you know, she's she's in. She's she she makes her, it back to the den. Yep, on her own. He does seven limbs. He's tempted to help, but he doesn't help. He just films her going back to her den, limping with one less arm, which has her brain in it. Yeah, lost a part of her brain. And then she's like, she's too weak to even change color. Yeah, she just turns white. And so, but he did crack open shells, like some muscles or something. muscles or something, and serve it to her to have some nourishment. And she took it. She took it, but he said it didn't, I don't think it did much good, but I think he might have been saying that because he, He's crossed, playing down he, his cro- he crossed his own boundary, which I'm like, dude, wait, you know, when you're in a relationship with an animal, all bets are off. Like, uh, it's not a pet, but it, it's a, it, there was a bond there, and he freaking, yeah, of course, I totally understand that he had to like do what he could to to help, but it was, 
it seemed like a little, little, too little too late until she freaking grew her arm back. Did you, I didn't, I forgot that that was possible. I didn't know it was possible. My she, jaw dropped. She grew the arm back. And so she had eight limbs again and she kind of came back to life. And again, so he lost contact with her, tracked her down, learned how to track her movements by looking at the sand on the bottom of the ocean. But he's got. Reunites with her, watches her get attacked by the shark. She loses the limb and then she gets back in business and the in the sort of the, the it goes on the and The relationship on and on. continues. And then, lo and behold, the same dang gong shark comes back, or one of the sharks that hunts at this reef comes back. And this point, this is when my mind started, I was like, am I experiencing reality correctly at this point? Yeah. Because the octopus has the ability to pick up all these shells and ball itself up and shield itself, it looks like a soccer ball that's made out of all these shells that it's holding. Mm -hmm. And there's a name for that as well. I can't remember what it was. And the the octop the, the I shark do not comes think, up. I do not think that this uh, this behavior was ever documented before he, he observed it. Because he says he remembers seeing that the the first time he ever came in contact with the octopus, it was in that state of this soccer ball with the shells, and he was like, "What the hell is this thing?" Right. And then he realized it's a octopus protecting itself. And then there's like epic battle with a shark that still is trying to eat the soccer ball of shells. And then, okay, two things, two remarkable things happen during the shark attack. The first thing that happens is is that the the once this the octopus the shark picks up the octopus and is shaking it around because it realizes okay this isn't a soccer ball this is an octopus but the octopus gets away and swims out of the water gets on the shore on a <laughs> rock and eventually has to get back in the water because it can't stay out too long and at that point it gets on the shark's back and rides the shark because it knows that the shark can't eat it as long as it's riding on it like it's a freaking horse but it rode it as a as a soccer ball of shells. Yeah, right. It kept itself in the shells while it did this. So that the fish was <laughs> so that the shark was totally confused. And then when it when it brushed up against some some coral, it just ever so normally, it just brushed itself off and floated away. This thing is so freaking smart and that's why you observe this thing every day for a year and you're making this bond with it and you're saying, okay, I'm now going to film my best ocean friend getting eaten alive. How much do you think was the, the, of the footage that we were seeing in the documentary was the footage that was captured in the moment when it happened? And how much was like filler, like filling it, like going I, back and filming later to make it make sense? Like pickups, like movie yeah. pickups, like. I do think the octopus is smart enough to, to comply to pickups. Like, hey, can you get on the back of that Pajama shark again, and you know it's like we kind of we're gonna look at the continuity photos. You're gonna get the same shells in the same because every single thing that would happen, I think he captured all. They of it. would he had incredible shots of it, and I think that was a level of obsession that I I totally understand. It's like again, you're making this bond, and then you don't know what's going to happen every day, and it's like, is this the day that I come back and the octopus is just not there? you know, has been attacked and is just gone. Um, am I gonna have to track it again? But th that's why it's so amazing to me that he didn't intervene, except in that one breach, you know, with feeding. And then it, you know, it's like comes back and it's like there's a, there's another octopus, they're mating, they've, well, ma they've mated, and then it's like he knows that she's gonna die at that point, so he's just, he's coming back every day to see. That's the end of the life cycle. Yeah, only a year. Something that smart. At what point in the process do you think that the inner filmmaker, there's a spark sometimes, especially when you're doing documentary film. There's a spark, uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of experience with this, but I do remember when, when we were making Looking for Miss Locklear, which is really the only documentary we've ever made, full length documentary. And once the search for our teacher became much larger and became about the struggle of the Lumbee people. Mm -hmm. And like we found ourselves in Washington DC at a hearing filming John McCain 
talk about you know the the Indian Affairs Committee. There was this moment that, I, that somewhere along the lines where I was like, we got something here, right? He was. At what point do you think he understood the potential for what he was creating? I mean, he was a nature documentarian. I think I think he had to be pretty early, and I do think that was the factor because I there's these. I'm I'm not that familiar with him, but I just I have to believe that there's these there's these rules of you don't intervene. You know, well, there's what, a famous photo that won uh, a prize of some sort, whatever the photo prize is. Um. Of uh, the starving child, right? Um, but I don't even remember when it was from. So it's, there's a journalistic principle that applies to nature as well. well just like, to, to okay. complete, complete the thought, though, there's a there's a picture of a starving child that was walking to get food, and this journalist, photojournalist, took a picture of the child, but did not assist the child. And I think the story goes that the child died. And when people found out about that, they were like, well, okay, what's more important, your journalistic principles or the life of this child? Um, this, is a, this isn't a child, this is an octopus we're talking about, but there is this sort of commitment to these journalistic principles that he went into the process knowing that like, if I'm gonna make this into something, I, 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 I understand the type of criticism that I'm gonna receive, especially when it's an animal, for intervening, right? And he and he really he held he held strong. I couldn't have done that, and I f- I found myself being angry with him when the when the the octopus was in that epic battle as a boulder because he could have just reached out and like slapped a shark. But maybe that's a good point to analyze because an extraordinary thing was documented that happened. You know, it's like it, you what, don't want to see a human hand come in there and like thump the shark away. Yeah, it. This is not the story. You know, he he was he was he was presenting her story, not their story. But really, I mean, the direct when the directors took the footage, they presented his story. But it was more about how you know he had a son, and there was a connection to. It was what did the octopus teach him? Uh, and there was, you know, his his takeaway was more of uh, that w- we're all connected, right? Well, and it raises a, lo- a larger question which I think we'll get into as we begin to talk about some of these other scenarios, which is what part of this incredible connection between this animal that's more intelligent than I ever understood? Uh, you know, and I, I think about, you know, my relationship with Barbara, your relationship with Jade, who's currently in your lap. Um, and definitely I attribute human emotions and human instincts to Barbara, like when Barbara looks at me with a, she gives me a facial expression Mm -hmm. that may be like, well, she's confused right now, or she is annoyed right now, or she's happy right now. And again, a lot of that is me projecting a human understanding onto a dog's face, even though we do know that dogs, uh, since, you know, being domesticated, have developed these things that only exist with them and don't exist with wolves, like the ability to, Make eye con- sustained eye contact with a human to get to to communicate via eye contact. That's not something that would happen with a wolf. Um, but even so, it makes sense that there's a there is some sort of emotional connection. Like I feel like when I'm doing my stretching in the morning, and Barbara comes and gets on my chest and like puts her head on my face or licks me or whatever. I don't think that she's just like, I'm doing this because you're going to feed me later. That might be a part of it. But I do think that she's there is an emotional component to it, mm-hmm. and but how much of this was an understanding that this octopus had, which is like, and again, they wouldn't put it in human terms, but like, how much of it do you think was, in so far as a, an octopus can consider a human a friend, that was what was going on. It seemed that way. It really did. I mean, like the. He he wasn't he the he she the octopus was not getting anything from him. He was except for that one little time. He was not feeding her. He was not doing anything except, uh, like being interesting. You know, she was interested, and there and there there was a connection. There was a form of relationship, like curling up on his chest and stuff like that, or just like swimming together. There was, I mean. He he witnessed her pl- being playful with fish, with fish and, yeah. you know. Once you really understand how something works, and it's extremely, you know, 
I'm so glad that we got a dog because I, I you know, it's until you experience a connection with an animal, it's just, you know, it's not something that, it's just not something you can judge from the outside. And that's what I was doing, right? So it's, it, it does something within a human soul, I think, to have a, to have a connection with an animal. Let's get to some of these, because I, I think these pro are an exploration of that point. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna talk about uh, Din Dim. Tell me about Din, Din Dim. The penguin. So in May of 2011, a guy named Joao Piera de Souza, which I would just call Mr. De Souza from this point on. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I'm reading from a, uh, points from a CNN article in, in 2016 about this. A humble retired bricklayer <laughs> rescued an injured penguin in, Where? The, in the state of Rio de Janeiro. Okay. Or Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and the flightless bird was covered in oil and uh, unable to move. So, I, uh, oil spill, I, it was you know one of those situations where you got a bird covered in oil. So, D'Souza took him. We're not talking sexy oil, we're talking right, yeah, this crude is a, oil. Like, not a lubricant. Well, it is, I guess, it, but you know, yeah. Not KY jelly. Uh, D'Souza took him under his wing. Uh, pun, and nurtured him back to health, thoroughly cleaning oil residue on the penguin's body and feeding him for days until he was fit enough to return to the water. So this guy basically lives on like an island nation, uh, lives on the beach essentially. Um, not an island nation, an island area near uh, Rio. So he took him to another nearby island to set him free, to set uh, Dindim free. And later, of course he hadn't named him at this point, later the, that day he hears some squawking in his backyard, and he's like, holy crap, the penguin is back. Hmm. He came back to the backyard. And he, the penguin, now he wasn't like, he didn't put him in an enclosure, he didn't treat him as a pet, he did feed him and he did touch him. Well, this penguin stayed with D'Souza for 11 months, and then he shed his annual coat of feathers, molted or whatever the term is, and suddenly was gone. Like he was nothing but feathers? <laughs> he disappeared, no. <laughs> that he, penguin was just a ball of feathers. All of a sudden. I've been duped. All of a sudden, he was not in his backyard. Okay. So at this point, D'Souza is thinking, okay, that was a weird but awesome thing, this short-lived relationship with this penguin that I nursed back to health. But then, the next year, he came back. He came back. To the backyard. And that's when you cry in the movie. And then, he left again. He's marching. Haven't you seen March of the Penguins? And it turned do something, right? And for years, every year since 2011, he has come back to his backyard at the same time. It's like an extended period of time. He like comes back in the middle of the summer and stays until like February and then goes away and then comes back at the same exact time. Now, it makes you cry cry a little. You know, you can it make makes yourself you, cry. Makes you well up because just imagine his, you know, the feeling he did. He did this, you know, selfless act of rescuing. Well, you want to cry? Look a, at the, a flightless bird. Look at the look at this video. Oh no! You have to describe what you're seeing. Here he is. This is this is him. He's waddling. He's waddling up, and he just puts his. He nuzzles him. What he, is he? He puts his beak on his face, and he doesn't do this. Kissing him. He, he kisses him, and he doesn't do this with any other humans. He doesn't allow any, if any other human tries to touch him, he bites them. Oh, wow. But he lets him be, give him baths, he's giving <laughs> him a shower. Slow shower. And then he, and he just let, he's told him, this is a humble bricklayer, Link. That's a humble bricklayer. I mean, and just, you know, it's just, it's such a rewarding connection. It's like, you, you do a selfless act, and then, it's recognized, it's like I owe you my life. I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna nuzzle you. Only you, I am not tame. Well, okay. I am allegiant. I don't wanna take any of the magic out of it, but I'm, gonna, but I'm gonna tell you something that has been theorized about this particular situation. Now the first thing oh, is, okay. for those of you who are like, how did you know it's the same penguin? <laughs> well, there were some scientists who asked the same question, and so in 2016 they tagged this, uh, they drew yes, graffiti penguin. on him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they, no, they they tagged the penguin so they could keep up with his location, and, and sure enough, it's the same penguin. And he travels like five thousand miles. Wow! But what? But okay. While the and this is from the article, while the idea of a penguin returning to visit every year seems surreal, Krajewski, who is a scientist, said that most uh, 
Magellanic or Mag it's like Magellan with an IC. Magellanic penguins are very loyal to their partner and nesting site. They nest in the same place every year and with the same partner. So in the circuitry of this penguin's brain mm -hmm. is a commitment to monogamy. And so one theory is that he sees D'Souza as his mate. He sees it as a another mm -hmm. penguin. Yeah. And so he has this tendency to bond and connect and almost imprint on this other being and it just happens that hey yeah, I you guys go and you spend time with other things that look like birds and you do th interesting sexual things with them and it makes baby penguins. I just go hang out with a humble bricklayer. Well, you should see the brick he can lay. <laughs> But I'm, still, it's beautiful and it's sweet. I'd like to see your mate Tammy lay brick. Right, exactly. You know? That's Dindim. I mean, I, I, I read an article about Yuriko the fish. That in, in, in Japan, uh, there's this uh, underwater shrine sacred to the Shinto religion and there is a caretaker of this shrine. So he like, he scuba dives down there, uh, he, Hiroyuki Arakawa, and uh, there's this like, I'll call it an ugly fish. Mm. I'm just gonna say it. It's an ugly, like it's a bottle, bottle head, bottle nose, like bulbous headed sheep, sheep's head, ras fish. It's not pretty. There's uh, no octopus. And this thing comes up, and, and uh, for 25 years, he greets her with a kiss on the forehead. But I watched the footage of it. I think you watched the footage too. A little less impressive. It's just a big old fish getting petted on the forehead and then. It, it looks like it wants something. Yeah, it looks like it wants something. I mean, it snapped at him and it, it seemed like it was eating something later. And then, but he kisses it on the head. That, that, that doesn't count for me. I mean, it's like, it's, that's, not a, that's not special. It's just like, hey, a fish knows you are gonna show up every day and maybe feed it or at least kiss it on the head. And I bet a little something comes out of your mouth that it tastes. A fish has got to be, and this fish looks really stupid. I mean, like, I think all fish are probably pretty dumb. This fish looks like especially stupid. But I mean, the fact that it's lived 25 years, I think, is just a testament to it. You don't have to be that smart to make it 25 years in the ocean. But let me tell you about this a crocodile. Okay. Okay. I got I got another one too. I, I just want I want to go ahead and skip to the crocodile. Okay. All right. Because I think it's this is crazy. All right. Um, a dude named Cheeto is in, uh, is in, he's in Central America. He, he's a fisherman. He finds a crocodile, like a small crocodile that's been shot by a farmer because it was like coming out, it was coming, he has cattle. And like shot it, shot this crocodile in the head, like in the eye to kill it. But then he finds it and he nurses it back to health over three years. Hmm. And like, he's like, He's like chewing stuff for this crocodile and like, and then giving it to the, like showing the crocodile, oh, you need to eat this. And then like <laughs> feeding it stuff and like being. He's like demonstrating chewing? Yeah, to a crocodile. And a, it worked. A crocodile, yeah, and this thing. How big is this thing? Uh, well, it was, it was small, but then over the three years of it regaining its, its vigor, this thing grew to 16 feet long. That's a big it's animal. It's a huge. Crocodile, um, and then he he named it Pocho, yeah. and uh, he puts it he puts it back, and he once it recovers he like he he sends it away, and then he gets up the next morning and that thing has come back and is in his yard, mm. and then he does it again does it three times and the crocodile Pocho just keeps coming back and hanging out in his yard he doesn't want to leave Cheeto, and so then Cheeto is compelled to spend more and more time with this crocodile to the point that uh, his wife starts to think he's sneaking around on him and like, uh, and then the, it realizes it's a crocodile but gets jealous. that The he wife gets jealous? And they get a divorce. He yeah. wasn't making love with it, was he? No, he wasn't. He was just spending more time with the crocodile he was spending with her and he's quoted as saying, another wife I could get. Pocho was one in a million. Well, you could say that again. He did get another wife 
and they had a daughter and the daughter's not allowed to like be around Pocho, but the Pocho will not leave. So like he's like spending all this quality time and learning all the intricacies of like how the crocodile looks and all this stuff. And he starts swimming with the crocodile and there's like a Nat Geo documentary, which incidentally is shot by the same person who was a cinematographer on uh, My Octopus Teacher. Really? Yeah. And in the opening shot, you see this crocod huge crocodile like in the water with his eye just eye eyes at the water level and then his mouth opens and you know you know how you see a crocodile's mouth just gape open and and then you realize no this is not the crocodile's mouth gaping open with there's like a huge bald head in its mouth no the crocodile's mouth is shut and a bald-headed man named Cheeto is underneath the crocodile pushing his head up and revealing himself. <laughs> this is like the opening shot of this uh, Nat Geo documentary. And he like, he rides on its back and he's, I mean, this is, this is, this is a, a reptile. You would think that this couldn't happen because again, the way that the the the, the reptilian brain they're not develops. That, they're not that smart, I mean it's like, yeah, it's, there, it's we we have a number of layers of brain on top absolutely. of the core of our brain. Basically, that's the reptilian brain about is just the, instinctual. That's what's so crazy about the octopus is that it's evolutionarily so much more separated. But yeah, a crocodile. I mean, he. But, but why he, doesn't he eat Cheeto? I mean, his name is Cheeto after all. <laughs> it's spelled differently, but the. It's not as compelling as the octopus thing because you can't attribute as much intelligence to the crocodile. But I mean, there's enough. There's there. a lot more risk, though. There's there is a bond, but and there are many documented cases of people like with you know after years and years of having a pet reptile, and he was he was a pet, but he was still in he was still but free to go. He's free to go now. They they'll they'll turn on you and just all kill right, you at any all point. Right. Didn't, didn't he die? He died. He died at age of fifty in twenty eleven. But the interesting thing is the how the crocodile. Yeah, Cheeto described it as be whenever he would play with the crocodile. It, he said it was like being with God. Mm. Like the dude was obsessed with this connection because it just it it can become so. I'll say magical. You you're able to cross this impossible boundary, and it's, I mean, it's you could tell in his interviews just how meaningful it was to him to have that connection. And it is interesting to explore like how much of that is, you know, projection. But it's real for him, and it's and it's well, and it did, is important for we, him. Well, we have a tendency, you know, post enlightenment, especially in the Western world, we have a tendency to do what we're doing, which we kind of just naturally do, which is to try to break it down to just its naturalistic elements. But there is- An emotional component. Well, it I, seems. I would say there even a spiritual component, right, potentially. Okay. So what, what I'm getting at is in so far as- That's what he did, yeah. When you talk about the idea of oneness, right, and the idea that Consciousness is a thing that exists. I'm not saying I subscribe to this idea, but it is a very intriguing way to look at the universe and the idea that there may not necessarily be, there could be uh, a God who is somehow separate from this creation and was the one who set everything in emotion. But to me, there's a slightly more interesting idea that in many ways seems more compelling that God is in everything, right? And is sort of, the universe is essentially a physical expression of a consciousness that exists that you and I and this wooden desk are all a part of. This is something that I used to, I, I, when I- And I, I'll just break in and say, I don't know if it's, it may be more interesting and compelling. It is interesting and compelling to me as well, but it may be because it's a little more, it's a newer idea to us, but- Well, I'm gonna talk about that because I actually feel like I remember when I used to hear about different Eastern religions and, and I heard about it in the context of growing up in a, in a conservative Christian home and a church where the way that we would interpret, say Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever, like when I learned that there were all these specific gods associated with different objects in Hinduism, mm -hmm. to me, I was like, that's ridiculous, right? I remember thinking that as a kid, I was like, that's really, that, that seems kinda, 
that seems sort of archaic and it seems like some, like an old kind of idea that you would attribute, you would find a God in a rock. Mystic, when, it, was, it was mystical. When, or I'm, what I'm saying is I belittled the idea. I'm, saying, I'm not saying that it was mystical. I, I'm, what I'm saying is okay. that I looked down on the idea. I thought that it was a bad way to look at the universe. I thought that it was a simple way to uni- look at the universe. And I was like, when you can- Or, or an ig- ignorant. Yeah, yeah, or like that kind of makes sense. Like maybe those people haven't evolved to a place where they can appreciate the idea of a personal creator God. But one, but one of the things that I'm kind of I'm reevaluating again, I don't know where I fall in, in this perspective, but when I think about that, I'm like, oh, it isn't necessarily just as simple, the su- super simple sort of dismissive view that I had, which was attributing a God or magic to every single thing. But to me, it's a way of kind of expressing that idea that there is life, there is God, whatever the word you wanna use, there is consciousness, in all things in sort of more of a sense of fabric of the universe, right? And so I do think there's been times in my life where I have felt connected to things that it would be like, it's weird to feel connected to a plant, right? But if you go back from a scientific standpoint to the point where, well, we come from the same place, we're all stardust. At one point, yeah. the same atoms that make up that plant, you know, the same atoms that make up me are gonna become the same atoms that make up a plant, that make up an animal, that make up the next jade. And what I'm getting at is, are you using jade as a visual example right now? I am, yeah. And so your connection with jade is, again, the Western enlightened view is that this is a lesser creature that is here for your benefit. This is here for you. The idea that you're human and therefore you must exercise dominion over all things on earth and that everything is here for your exploitation. There's a different way to look at things which is we're all part of the same system in a much yeah. more integrated and thorough way than we ever appreciated. And when you do, when you think about it like that, maybe what's happened between Cheeto and Pocho is a <laughs> sort of strange it's an, an anomaly, but it's an expression of that type of connection that can happen between beings. I'm not gonna swim with a croc to find God, but he did. Right. He did. And it, and it, uh, his second wife was with it. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it is interesting. I, I do want you to get to the lion. I, you know, I, uh, I had heard about this, but like, this is a, it's, the, the the relationship narrative associated with this is uh, is flooring. Well, and this is a video that you've seen, if you're one of the 100 million people who have watched it. Uh, Christian the Lion, mm-hmm. you may have seen about 10 years ago, there was a, a video that went viral and it's it's obviously like old footage. It's from the late 60s. And I think the original version doesn't even have any sound, but there's these two very hippie looking <laughs> white dudes with long hair and bell bottoms and they're like out in Africa. Bell bottoms, yeah. And next thing you know, there's a freaking lion that se- still seems to be juvenile, it doesn't have a mane yet, but is a freaking 500 pound creature that could easily kill them. Starts running up to them and you're like, oh no, what's about to happen? And it jumps up and it hugs this dude. And then it's just like, licking him and hugging him and frolicking and then it goes up to the other guy and the same thing happens and they're like laughing and it's one of these things you're like what it's one of, I've seen this before like on Tiger King you know I've seen people interact with big cats that they were raised in captivity but this these guys are in the middle of Africa the bush and this thing comes out so the story behind this is that uh again late 60s there's two Australian dudes who see a lion cub for sale in England because there was a, a, an exotic animals market at that time, they purchased this thing. Not they're in their early twenties. They're they're not trying to take advantage of the thing. They're just like let's. Who knows where this thing's going to end up? Let's give it a good life. And they do this. They raise this thing in their apartment, in their flat, in England, and this uh, lion cub grows over the course of a year and is their pet and stays in their house, rides in the back of their convertible Mercedes everywhere (laughs) they go around town, goes to parties with them, becomes friends with their friends and there's like an account of him jumping up on a woman 
uh, that was one of the lion's friends and he accidentally like claws her dress and it falls to the floor. Like, oh, these crazy surreal, this seems like some sort of like Wes Anderson movie where there's this lion friend who is going along with these guys. Now eventually they're, they're, they realize this cannot continue, mm -hmm. he's too big, he's never shown any signs that he's gonna hurt anybody but he doesn't really understand his own strength and it's probably not moral to keep this thing in England. Probably not. So they take him to Kenya where they just what drop him off or whatever and at this point you're thinking, this thing has never lived in the wild, surely this thing's gonna die. Well. If you watch that video, you'll see one of the things that happens is after he's, after they're interacting with this male lion, all of a sudden a female lion comes up to them and starts interacting with them. Not in the same way, but it's basically just right there next to them walking curious. around. Curious and, and like coming up next to them and kind of rubbing up on them. They put Christian the lion in the bush. It came back three months later, thinking they would never see him again. Three months later? Three months later, he comes up to them hugs them like that and then brings them his wife and they meet, they stay there for nine days and they meet his wife and his kids. He's got, a, they have a litter, whatever the correct term, of cubs. So he That couldn't have happened in three months though. Uh, I think it could. You have babies in three months? Maybe if you're a lion. I don't know what the gestation period is. I don't know if I've got all the facts right but I do know when he came back, he had, uh, he introduced them to his wife and kids. He and made it. He made it. He made it and he made it. <laughs> uh, and then they never saw him again. I don't know, it, the story kinda ends there. But these guys, when the video went viral in 2011, they ended up going on like the Today Show and of course they were much older at this point and then they signed a movie deal where Zac Efron was gonna play one of them and <laughs> it was, I don't think that ever happened because I looked and I couldn't find it. Yeah, the, the whole captivity thing is a, Complicates complicates it. this this conversation, but I mean the fact that there's you know it's, having a connection with with an animal it, it one of the things this highlights is how extraordinary it was w th with an octopus you know <laughs> going back to that you know because they're just you know you might have one in an aquarium but you're not going to have a an actual relationship this connection and it was just. It's mind blowing. Does it make you think twice? I like them more. About enjoying octopus at a fancy restaurant. It gives me an easier excuse to to uh, not eat it. I, I think so you don't like I, it. I've I, had it a couple of times, and I and I, re and and I, I really didn't do like hate it. it. But I've I've never. I've never seen it on the menu and said I gotta have this. And I'm the exact opposite. So if, if, I, see, if I see it on the menu, I order it without exception. If octopus is on the menu, I order it. What about now? Oh man, this is tough. <laughs> Seriously? And it, it, you well, cried three times? Well, again, I'm not trying to go f philosophical here and I'm also not trying to justify my own behavior, but just go go with me on another little journey for a second. Okay, okay. okay? Don't hold your dog up in the middle of it. Just stay with me. <laughs> I'm not. Um, I've thought about this, and I thought about this as it relates to the morality of eating meat. Right? It's something. I mean, I, I actually think about it on a pretty regular basis. Right? Um, and if you follow that sort of oneness idea, and that we're all connected. I mean, first of all, the distinction that we make between plants and animals. Uh, obviously, it's a, there's a, there's a there is a distinction between plants and animals. There are some weird sort of intermediate things. Uh, and I do think that for whatever reason, the closer something gets to our level of intelligence, for good reason, it becomes weirder to eat it, right? But everybody draws a line at some point. Some people say anything with eyes, anything with a face. Some people say anything with a conscience, as however you define that. But there's a lot of there's actually a lot of evidence to suggest that there is a level of consciousness amongst plants, right? When you eat a plant, you are killing it. Um, you're constantly murdering microorganisms that have some level of consciousness just by being a person, meaning that there is a give and take that happens between beings in the universe. Now there are some things that you can point to that really seem totally unnecessarily exploitative like factory farming as an example, right? When you begin to see an animal 
simply as a, as, a, as a source of food and its existence is just for the benefit of you being able to eat exactly the right kind of beef that you want or whatever. And then of course, what the net effect of that is, is that there is an animal that is being bred in a certain way in a certain environment that is just to be eaten, which is different than, hey, there's a deer that's out here enjoying its life, doing its thing, being a part of nature. It's going to be killed by something eventually, right? It's usually, animals in the wild don't usually die of natural causes, they end up getting eaten by predators. And so there are points at which a human enters the food chain and says, I'm the predator and I'm going to, anyway, I believe that you can kill an animal for the purpose of it being food and do it in a respectful way that is actually respecting its life. I think that that's a possible thing to do. So all that to say, from a moral standpoint, while I understand someone saying from a moral standpoint, I will not eat animals, period. I think that uh, it's, it's a much more complex thing than a lot of people maybe are willing to, to admit because there's a lot of gray in, in that equation. So you but, will eat the octopus. Uh, well, what, I guess what I'm saying is, again, not trying to defend myself and justify myself, but I honestly feel my perspective is I can be absolutely amazed at the octopus, appreciate the octopus in a way that I never did before um, and still eat the octopus. Like I don't, I, I, I don't even like I don't have to, what I'm saying is I, if, it, if, I, if I get to a point where I have to disrespect an animal in order to be able to eat it, I'm not saying, I, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't disrespect, I don't think that cow, a cow's life is, 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 is pointless. I don't think that I have sympathy for a, for a cow. I eat beef at the same time. And I, it, you know, listen. I may get to a point where it's like that contradiction is something that is truly a contradiction that I can't live with. Uh, but I actually think there's more compelling reasons to stop eating meat than the moral dilemma around the, the life of an animal. But anyway, well, what what about this? What animal would we each choose? Wild animal would we choose to, to have a best friendship with that would remain? Wild, not not domestication, not making a pet, not putting in a pen, or in your house or in your convertible. But like, if you could go and go into on their terms, be friends with that animal, what would it be? I really like the idea of 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 being of like scuba diving. I I can't do this the the uh, the skin diving. You could though. No one can do it at the beginning. That's what I've heard. I know. I just, no one can do it at the beginning. I have an anxiety of like holding my breath. Like it's everyone tough. has that anxiety. That's what I. I what, were, we, were we talking about this before? Oh, it was that book. The book I told you about that I wanted to do a whole episode on. That we I don't. We can talk about it later. But the guy talks about it in the book. Well, I know that that everyone has this underwater that, anxiety. But but like I would love to get my my scuba license. I've wanted to do that ever since I've been snorkeling. A couple of times, I'm like, man, I want to go deeper, but I don't want to have to hold my breath. Oh yeah, there's scuba diving. I'm actually more freaked out by the scuba than I am the free diving. So I'm well. I'm actually so I'm thinking in that realm. It could be an octopus for me now. It could be. Well, I think you got to pick something original. That's been done. You have to have a my, you know, my sea bass teacher. <laughs> yeah, That'll be I, your don't, I don't think there's. I mean, I mean, there's some. Some of the mammals in the ocean, any well, clearly, any mammal in the dolphin, ocean, but a, that's a dolphin connection. Uh, so I don't know. I I guess I do want to seahorse. You stay like little in. horses? Uh, they're not smart. Well, what if they are? You don't know that. What if you could have a little seahorse that just nestles up into your chest region? Yeah, that's cool. I would want one of the bigger ones though. The biggest seahorse is for you. How big do they get? I think they can get as big as your thigh. No. No way a seahorse gets that big. Maybe as big as my foot. I don't think a seahorse gets that big. I think they, Maybe I think at some they get point a in size the 11 past. foot. You US, think there's. US size 11 shoe. I, well, I gotta ask this question now. How big can a seahorse get? Uh, can range in size from 0. 0.6 inches to 14 inches long. I'm that's a size, you, that's a size 14. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big seahorse, man. You can find a big size 14. Uh, can seahorses kill humans is also. Um, and they, they could nuzzle 
Wow. In a way that a horse would. It says, might seem like the most harmless, unassuming creatures under the sea, but they're actually one of the most deadly. Okay, forget it. What? Just a normal You're horse be on land. By a seahorse. You know, I mean, people have these connections with horses. There's like therapy associated with horses. Like they they have they have this ki- this like cosmic connection to people. So I just got to go back to a regular horse. Final answer. What's your answer? But it has to be a wild horse. Yep. It can't just be like a horse in a stable somewhere in Burbank. Yeah. It it has to. I only like a I'm Mustang. Gonna, I'm gonna ride it only by invitation. Like it's gonna have to kneel down <laughs> and kind of is like when when the horse picked up Aragorn when he was like totally decimated, he seemed dead, and the horse like basically put him on his back. That that that's how it would have to happen. But it would after like a year. Um. Well, mine is my animal is horse like in a sense, and it's also. I think I've been on record saying that this is my favorite animal. Giraffe. Um, I'm a very, I'm tall, I'm a very large man. And, and the idea, could you imagine what it would be like to be friends with a giraffe? Just think about that for a second. First of all, they're obviously they're so tall, gentle and sweet. I've seen the eyelashes on those things. And, um, they are also rideable. That's not. I'm not in this just for the ride. <laughs> but riding a giraffe would well, be one of the more badass things that you could do. Again, this would be in the context of a friendship. It wouldn't be in the context of. It would have to be initiated by the giraffe. Yeah, I know I'm, there's I'm no saddle. That. I wouldn't have a saddle made. Uh, I'd be riding this thing bareback and I would be holding on to its neck I wouldn't even be grabbing onto its its hair because that's kind of like it. riding a um, a hobby horse or like a carousel horse. Yeah, and this is only if again if I was invited to ride it. But I think that if you are in a friendship with a giraffe, I think that's part of it. I just think you'd be walking with it, and it would just be. I know, think I might grab onto one of its legs, like one of those little stuffed like a, animal like monkeys a child. that just like stays on a leg. And I just hold on to the leg and go around, and then occasionally it throws me up and lets me walk up its neck. To You're kind of missing the relationship. It, I was looking for more of like you would read aloud to it. Well, this is all part of it. You read aloud. I'm just to talking the about the more sensational things. Okay, is that your final answer? The, and there is a place. There is a hotel. Yeah, it's called Disney World. There's a hotel in Africa. Oh, where. Again, I don't know. I don't know if these things are like just on the premises. I don't know the situation. I'm not advocating like pet giraffes. Like giraffes need to be in the wild. But there is a hotel where you eat. You're you're in your room and you're like eating breakfast, Listen. and the giraffes come in and like interact with you. I think it's giraffes. I've seen this. Yeah, I've seen a picture of it. I don't know about the. I don't know about if it's ethical. So I'm not saying I'm doing it. If they're wild giraffes that have somehow just become comfortable with people, then I might go. If they're like giraffes that they're keeping and making interact with people for money, then I'm not a part of it. But well, I think that's where the hotel comes in. Well, I mean, maybe the giraffes are. What are the giraffes getting? I at? don't know. Yeah, I'm just saying you're out in the wild. You're reading a book to a giraffe. Just keep it pure. You're the one muddying everything. <laughs> just keep it pure, man. Just, listen. The world is complex. And when it and when it gets attacked, you can't intervene. I don't know what I would do in the case of a, anything that it can hurt a giraffe. I'm gonna tell you right now. Not something I could do something about. But you as a seahorse I, man. I, w- I would intervene with my friend because I'm not a nature documentarian and that's why I'm not. Because I want the seahorses to be, I'm gonna do everything in my power to protect my seahorses. Well, my seahorse friends, they're not mine, I don't own them. Oh, so you did go back to seahorse. I took oh, you yeah. back to seahorse, I thought <laughs> you went to land horse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. I could have a, I could have, I could have both. Okay, so tell us what you think, you know what? Yeah, I know, uh, you don't have to tell me what you think about the controversial things I said, there's, an, there's, there's already enough of that. Just, just tell us what you think about, <laughs> just tell us about. Octopus teacher, octopus what did the teacher. octopus teach you? Yeah. Hashtag your biscuits, we'll speak at you next week. 
To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.